Hey guys, what's going on? Basin Boy here, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another video. This is not a normal Civ video. Um, uh, as you could, if you haven't heard, uh, check back in my uh, in my channel update video. Um, the Indonesia series I'm putting on hold because of this new DLC. I don't think I'll be able to finish it in time, and also my save got corrupted, and it wasn't wasn't great. So that series is gonna basically gonna come to an end. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be starting a new Civ series after that, but up until then, Crusader Kings is going to be one of the main things on my channel, and we'll be uh, experimenting with some other stuff as well. Uh, so yeah, check out the video for full details and everything like that. Um, but this video is about Civ Six Rise and Fall. Um, I've uh, I've been watching videos on it. I've been uh, taking uh, taking some notes on watching devs play it and watching all the announcements and everything like that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through all the civs that have been announced up to so far and what I think of them and what I think of the uh, expansion in general. So uh, here's the uh, here's the main thing here. Um, and here we go. If civilizations are not set in stone. You can't do all the hard work beginning to expect your culture to stand the test of the time test of time on challenge. It's not like that in the real world or in civilization games. The expansion we're announcing today, which is a while ago, Rise and Fall has new dynamic layers onto the game you've already been enjoying. Uh, February 8th is when it's coming out. Golden Ages, uh, okay. There's the announcement trailer. We're not going to watch that at all because I think it's 12 minutes long. You should definitely take a watch if you haven't. Um, Anton's talking about blah blah blah. His storytelling elements. Golden Dark Ages are coming. The Golden and Dark Ages are among new events that can shift the course of your game's history. They are significant but temporary changes to a civilization that lasts for an era. They will have new opportunities for players to ch change their strength and change the state of the game between player, between the player and their rivals. Having a Gold Age affords huge bonuses to loyalty and other game systems, but makes earning future Golden Ages slightly more difficult. Having a Dark Age hurts loyalty in your cities and makes you vulnerable, but it gives you the opportunity to f to earn future golden ages more e easily. It allows the use of special dark si dark age policies and opens the door for even more powerful heroic age. Think of it this way: while golden age provides dedication bonus, being in heroic age lets the player earn three dedication bonuses, making sort of a triple golden age. Uh, player era. They've advanced on that sort of stuff. Cool, cool. Maybe in a golden age that they might join dark age yes, era. Opening opportunity. To the change of strategy. So, in the live stream, this was one of the. Uh, I think they really focused on that in one of them. I think it was the, uh, the Mongol one, um, when they were talking about different ages and stuff like that. Uh, Golden Ages basically, your cities now have this this thing called loyalty. Uh, I'm gonna sum this up real quick instead of reading everything. Um, loyalty is basically this concept of your cities. How close are they together? How close are they together? Um, how much pressure do you exert as a as a leader to those cities uh and your cities if they're far away from your capital or you're not sending trade routes to them or doing anything they can become unloyal to you and form their own city basically um they'll declare independence that sort of idea and other civs can claim them if they have enough influence uh instead of you and then the it'll shift back and forth so i think it's a really cool idea trying to get all these different sort of things going uh, it's making Civ a much more complex game, rather than uh, completely like single, single-minded, uh, and like uh, being weird. Um, it, 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 I think it's going to be really cool, and I can't wait to to see how that works. Um, but Golden Ages and Heroic Ages, Golden Ages, as I said before, it it, it shows more loyalty. Like uh, you're at less risk of like losing a city because your influence. Uh, reaches further. So if you're on like the border, say you're playing as uh I don't know, you're playing as Indonesia and uh you have a Mongolian city next to you and you're exerting and you have a golden age while they're in a dark age, uh you're starting to exert pressure on one of their cities and therefore that city becomes uh its own thing and then you capture that city and so it be that becomes more of a thing. Peace your people also just are much more happier, they're a little more productive, you get these cool bonuses, that sort of stuff like that. I think it's a really, really cool idea. I think it'll, um, it'll be really good to see what they do here, coming up here. I think, uh, 
I think this adds another layer to the game uh, than uh, than just uh, walking around and doing things. Governor's rule. So governors, from what I've uh, what I've understanding. Uh, let's see what they have to say, like, in actual terms. Previous versions of civilization, Governor often referred to the AI behavior you could set for a difficulty to act on the city on your behalf. In this expansion, though, they are opposite. Sending a governor to your city is waiting for make the player to make an active decision about the development of one of their cities. Much like districts offer governors special cities. Cool. During a game, you play, uh, seven governors. Each governor has a different scripture. Blah, 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 blah. So they don't have them all here, but I think there's seven. They said there's seven in general. Um, the one that they're really showing off is the diplomatic one, which uh, basically, as far as I know, you can put in one of your cities and increase the loyalty in that city. So if you have one that's far away uh, from the, your capital or far away from your empire, you stick them there, they'll be more loyal to you. That sort of idea. I think that's a I think that's really cool. Also, you can see one of the new wonders that they're adding in here, uh, the Statue of Liberty. So... That's cool. Uh, also, what I was uh, going off of that point, uh, there's there's different ones that can help increase production uh, to military units. There's ones that provide different bonuses for farms or stuff like that. So there's a whole different uh, idea about, or a different sort of concept about how these uh, governors can can operate cities. Uh, it and it can change from time to time if one city's flourishing in science, there's one that can help boost that science even further, and like that sort of idea. I think it's really, really cool that this isn't adding another layer on top of the other layers that they already have. Enhancing your alliances. Alliances within Civ 6 already offered a lot, but the expansion adds more. Alliances in the base game off of board and sort of guarantee that the other player would not interfere with your strategy by attacking you, but only rarely did it offer tangible benefits. So, for Civ 6 Rise and Fall, we had a more tangible incentives, blah blah blah. There are new alliances types, research, military, economic, cultural, or religious, that determines the benefits. Uh, alliance continues, it levels itself up and unlocks more powerful bonuses. Uh, and then it's going to give us an example. Research Alliance, level 1, they receive science bonus to the trade routes. Level 2, allies receive their science bonuses, but also receive one tech boost at a regular interval. Level 3 is all of the above, plus science when researching the same technology or technology that your ally had already researched. So, I think that's really, really, really cool. So basically, your alliances become much more important, or you pick your friends that are important. Say you're, I don't know, I'm trying to think, you're, you're playing as Greece, and you're focusing really heavy on culture, and you don't have a lot of uh, research or science, and uh, you have Korea in your game, which is a which we'll get to, and they're just a powerhouse of, of science. Um, they, um, you can ally them, and you can form a research uh, alliance. So therefore, you'll be getting, you'll be getting some science bonuses. And then at level three, if they're way ahead of you, you can research your text, fa uh, research those texts faster than the other one. And then it, it military. I'm assuming is building military units, and then like when there's a uh, declaration of war on you, the other ally joins, that sort of stuff, economic, same idea, etc, etc, etc. Um, and then I think that this is probably going to be my favorite, favorite thing that they're adding. It's called, they're called emergency situ situations. Emergencies are new within Civ 6. Most emergencies get triggered when one player has a significant lead or an advantage in an area. Converting a holy city to a different religion or using your nuclear weapon when triggered, the game determines what other which other players can join in an emergency against the target player. And each player can choose the joiner pass. Joining can give permanent benefits, but only if the players are able to com to complete an emergency uh, complete an emergency specific objective against the target time. Otherwise, the target gets the benefit instead. They are sort of tricks and balance systems. You see their delicate balance strike, making the game more dynamic and also ensuring it stays fair for the players to develop a strong lead. Cool of... It's, it, I just think it's su such a cool concept. It's basically like the World Council, but small. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking of, at least from like Civ Five. Like, you have all these different... You have all these different nations, and one's getting ahead, and you're like, oh, they're getting really ahead of me in in doing something and you can you could vote to embargo them uh in other in Civ five. That sort of idea. But I think I think this is uh this is getting getting 
get into the World Council or whatever they called it before. Um, I think this is the first step towards it. I think it's a it's a nice thing to introduce in here without uh, giving us too much because I feel like if they did include the World Council, um, that it would be this would be packed bang for your buck sort of idea. But I feel like there'd be so much new to, new stuff to learn, and I don't know where they would go from there. So I think that this is cool. Uh, and I think I think this will this will really really help players that I think feel like they get way too ahead of ahead of the AI. The AI can group up on you and kind of do that. Retelling your story. I'm not going to read all this because it's it's really self really self explainable. You do this. You every time you complete complete something. Like you build your first scout, you found your first city, you found another city, you make contact with the city state, you're the first one to build a knight unit, you're the first to build an iron mine, that sort of stuff. You get these like little moments, uh, historic moments, and they and those moments count towards your era score, which in turn makes you prosper in a golden age, or if you don't get enough of them, you're in a dark age, or that you're in the normal age, um, you're just cruising along. So those kind of lead to that. Then they're like the little tiny. They'll be like achievements. Like if you click on the thing up top, and it'll show you like, oh, you beat a barbarian encampment. Oh, you did this. Oh, you did that. For the bigger ones, you'll have a picture with them. That sort of idea. Um, and then new civilizations, new leaders. Not we're go we're gonna get into that. I'm not gonna read all of this. They're still gonna balance some stuff out basically, and yeah. So what I wanted to do now is go to their YouTube channel, and I wanted to talk about each. Poundmaker leads the Cree in Civilization VI: Rise and Fall. All right. Anyway, um, what I, what I wanted to say, without being uh, so rudely interrupted, was he. Queen the first Sunduk Korea. leads Korea in civil. So I'm I'm going to mute it because I already know what I want to talk about. She's got her model updated a little bit. A little bit, um, which they which they showed us before. Um, so she's basically becoming a uh, a mad powerhouse. They have this uh, unique uh, unique improvement uh, that basically instead of uh, oh change it to full screen. Basically, instead of putting it putting stuff next to a mountain or rainforest where you get your adjacency bonuses. She has this special concept of when she builds uh, things next to it or mines, she'll get uh, she'll get different bonuses. She'll get uh, bonuses for that. So like building on top of this luxury resource, having a mine, having a farm, you get all those extra adjacency bonuses. Um, the special unit is the Hawacha, or uh, which basically is a very powerful um, ranged unit. Uh, yeah, you can see here. What she has, the Siwa, I think that's what it's called. Um, that's their unique district. The Huacha is the unique land unit. Um, their bonus uh, is the three kingdoms. Mine receive plus one science if there's an adjacent uh, uh, Siwa district. Farms receive plus one food if there's an if there's an adjacent one. So it's just kind of playing off this idea. So the their their unique uh, district gets a bonus from their um what is it the uh, the oh, I can't think of it the co the country ability they get a bonus because of that and then there's her special thing is plus five percent culture plus five percent science in all cities with established governor so it's a really cool way to play off the new governor system. Where you get more science and more culture. So as I was saying, Korea is going to be this huge powerhouse. Um, oh, I felt like I needed a burp. Sorry. Going to be this huge um, science powerhouse in the game, which is usually what Korea is in all Civ games, uh, to be frank. Uh, and I and I wouldn't expect anything different. It just seems really really cool and really unique, um, in a in a way. So. Uh, that's about it for her. We're going to go back and we're going to look at the second one, which is the Netherlands. So, the, N the Netherlands are, uh, are really also really interesting um, in a way. Because I feel, like, I feel like the Netherlands really 
really I think in Civ Five, they're like one of the first Civs I played it I played as. And so like they really have a a, a specific like place in my heart for uh for this. Um and uh, the Netherlands have some really cool cool things. Um like they basically have a culture bomb but for harbors and they have the unique unit which can only be built when there's three three pieces of land adjacent to it. And it's usually built on uh on like a river or coastal tile. Um and since there's one, two and I guess this is technically three, they can build uh their their unique uh improvement here, which basically gives them extra bonus to food and gold and that sort of stuff. And and it and they grow throughout the game. Uh their unique unit, uh hopefully will be they'll show her. Uh yeah, they will coming up. Uh it's a very powerful uh, ranged unit that is good for um, the Des Ven Proficient. Uh, that that sounds French. They're not French. God. Uh, anyway, uh, from what I've heard, they're really they're really good at um, attacking cities. Uh, they have a really high damage, uh, but that's mainly what they're going to be used for. The polder is what their that unique thing was. Uh, her main feature and ability is uh, your trade routes pl provide plus one identity per turn for the stunning city. Trade routes to foreign cities and or from foreign cities provide plus plus one culture to you. So it's just um, it's just one one of those cool cool things that trading she's going to get a lot of bonuses from that and then the Grota Riveren uh, major ac adjacency bonuses for campuses, theater squares, or industrial zones if next to a river culture bomb adjacent tiles when completing a harbor basically basically what I was saying before they have they have some really cool uh, cool things going on here uh, and I think they'll be really really fun to play against also I think they changed the color for um, John Curtin, I think it's they're now green, so that since so they won't be so close anymore in colors. So uh, the next one I think that was announced was Mongolia. Let me just double check. Bruh, yep, it was Mongolia. Uh, so basically, Mongolia is what we what we've expected to come of them uh, in different in in other Civ games. They're the barbarian horde. Uh, Genghis Khan was going to be leading them, uh, per usual, and so the uh, the Mongols are very domination based. They uh, they they basically get bonuses when uh, when they send trade routes or they they gain a different diplomatic like access sort of thing. Um, like the the more spies you send, or the the more the more inform I forget the the exact term of it. But the more um, the more you know about a civilization, basically, it ups your power by a whole bunch. Um, and I'm I'm just double checking because I think I think one of the okay here it is the Mongol horde all cavalry class units gain plus three combat strengths and a chance to capture defeated enemy cavalry class units. Yeah, so basically, whenever they attack a cavalry unit. Um, there's a chance to convert that cavalry unit to yours, so you just keep growing this. Uh, you keep growing yourself. I sorry, I didn't want to look at that face. The Ortu is the. Uh, it it gives it a starting trade route immediately, creates a trading post in the destination city, receive an extra level of diplomatic visibility for possessing a trading post in any city of a civilization. All Mongolian units gain plus three combat strength for each level of diplomatic visibility visibility on their opponent. Uh, the Kashig is uh, basically their unique unit. They're very powerful. They um, they get extra movement when coming out when they're built in their unique building. I think their unique building gives it basically to every cavalry unit, uh, which is replacing the stable, if I remember correctly. So that's basically Mongolia in a nutshell. Um, then, I'm actually going to let you listen to the India, because it's there's not there's some different things but there's there's not i i will pause and stop but i won't want you to take a listen to this rise and fall he unified much of the indian subcontinent building one of the largest empires in the region he later abdicated his throne renounced everything and died an enlightened jain monk chandragupta is the second alternative leader to join the civilization 6 leader lineup 
These different leaders allow players to take the Civ strengths in slightly different directions. While Gandhi's empire flourishes in times of peace, Chandragupta allows you to play as India more aggressively. Chandragupta gets India's unique ability Dharma, as well as the ability to build step wells and Varu units. His unique ability is Artha Shastra. After researching the military training Civic, he may declare a war of territorial expansion, with additional movement and combat strength during the opening turns of the war. So, uh, I, I wanted to go back and uh, just talk about his, and uh, units. his <laughs> some of his, his, his things unique. here. Um, so, declare war to territorial expansion, which is basically like, I want your city, so I'm going to take it, sort of idea. And that uh, that gives him a light penalty, or how I, I'm assuming it goes up as later as the game goes on. I think it's really cool to have these. Um, I wanted to play that beginning part for you because I think they did a good job of explaining that Gandhi is peaceful while he is not. Uh, Dharma, of course, receives the follower belief bonuses in the city from one religion that ha from each religion that has at least one follower, the Varu and the Stepwa. So it's basically India, but for people who want to play India aggressive. That's about it. And then finally, my favorite civilization. I'm just going to let this one play out, and then I'll talk to you at the end. Poundmaker leads the Kree in Civilization VI, Rise and Fall. He ruled his people during a tumultuous time in Kree history, judiciously towing the line between aggression and diplomacy. Today he is remembered for his work to secure peace between the Kree and Canadian government. The Cree's unique ability is Nihita. They receive their first trade route when they research pottery. The first time a trader moves into an unclaimed tile within three tiles of a Cree city, that tile is claimed. The Cree's unique improvement is the Mechawap. This provides housing and production, as well as gold when adjacent to a luxury resource, and food when adjacent to bonus resources. Their unique unit is the Okichita. This reconnaissance unit replaces the Scout but receives a free promotion and has additional combat strength. Poundmaker's unique ability is favorable terms. All alliances provide shared visibility and external trade routes grant additional food when trading with cities with camps and pastures. The recipient of the trade route receives additional gold per camp or pasture. Creating and maintaining high level alliances will bring you economic and political success as Poundmaker and your traders will be invaluable to extending your empire. Researching pottery right away will get you off to a quick start as you extend your land and begin sowing the seeds of friendship with your neighbors. Will you stand united and strong with your allies? How will you lead the Cree in Sid Meier's Civilization VI Rise and Fall? Yes, as I was, as I want to end this Fall. note on the video, um, I, I think I think uh, the Kree is going to be exceptional. I think they're probably going to be one of the best civs in the whole game, um, because I just feel like the 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 way that they're built as as the uh, like the history reflects them well. That sort of idea. Just I I, I can't describe how excited I am to play as the Kree. Um, they probably will be the first campaign I play as. If not them, then probably Amsterdam. Unless they throw, like... I don't know. Unless they throw, um... I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up a random sieve. Unless they throw, like, a, um... An Italian. I don't know. Like an Italian civilization. Uh, <laughs> if they do throw an Italian civilization, oh well. Or a Mexican civilization, that'd be cool. Or, act, an act, like, I know that the Crees act Canadian, but I would love to see an actual, like, Canada Civ. But, um, we'll see. We'll see what's going on. And, um, and yeah, so I wanted to end that on this note. Um, so, yeah, if, you, if you're if you new here, it'd be great. Hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave a comment telling me what you like and what you don't like. Actually, leave a comment telling me about what your favorite leader is so far. Uh, I'll be trying to make update videos on each of the new leaders as they come out. It might be not being the exact day, they'll probably be at the end of the week. Because, you know, college and stuff. But, yeah. Um, love you guys. And I'll see you next time.